Good morning. My name is Ling Shui Ling, and I'm an executive producer at Channel News Asia in Singapore. I'm very pleased to be the moderator for this session, which is called the biggest trade deal in the world. When, the, when we started this year, it looked pretty hazy. Lots of things were still happening. The pandemic still was roiling the world. A lot of things also on current affairs that were pressurizing things. But one good thing seemed to come out of 1st Jan 2022, and that was the kickoff of RCEP, the biggest trade deal in the world. It came with a promise of creating more than 2 million jobs and a never before opening up of markets in North Asia between China, Japan, and South Korea. But five months on, has RCEP delivered? With me is an excellent panel whom I hope will answer some of the questions, but in truth, actually, we're also hoping we'll come up with some very good questions that will lead us forward. On my right here is um, Bapa Muhammad uh, Lutfi, who is the Trade Minister of Indonesia. Indonesia is the very, very largest economy of the ASEAN countries and a major leader. This is actually the minister's second round as Trade Minister. He's been in this role twice. And prior to that, he was also ambassador to the US as well as to Japan. On my left here is Mr. Tak Dinami. Mr. Tak Dinami is CEO of Suntory, which is the largest food and beverage company in Japan. And I think there are very, very few people in this room who have not actually tried either Yamazaki <laughs> or Orangina. <laughs> so on all ends of the spectrum, Suntory is a very, very major player. Prof. Simon Evanet, he is international trade professor at St. Gallen here in Switzerland. But he also does something fascinating, and that is the Global Trade Alert, which is, I think, one very uniquely that monitors protectionism around the world. So if that is a, or if you want to use another term, security. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on who's using it. <laughs> ah, there you go. We've started the conversation already. So, but at last, but absolutely not least, Abba Schubert. Abba is doing a wonderful job in providing uh, technological services for the global trade industry. And she has a lot to say concerning, will we be able to just get our goods, our clothes, our whatever we're ordering more reliably and possibly even cheaper mm. when trade deals come in? All right, let's kick off with the question I asked right in the beginning. Minister, do you think RCEP has delivered? Well, uh, COVID also being blamed for these things. Um, this is 10 countries, you know, some are very big, uh, 10 of ASEAN countries plus five uh, uh, dialogue partners, uh, including uh, big economies, smaller economies, uh, big democracy, you know, at least one kingdom of absolute monarch, two communist countries, four big democracies. So in the countries, uh, all of all in all, we're moving forward very good. We're supposed to ratify everything by the 1st of January, but COVID in Indonesia, I have to go back to parliament to get that ratified. Uh, Indonesia, uh, maybe with the Philippines will be the last, uh, maybe by, uh, I'm, gonna ha I'm going to see the parliament on the uh, 9th of June to have the final process of this. So we're looking second semester, the kickoff of ratifications of RCEP. This is the biggest uh, trade deal ever. 30% of the populations, 30% of the GDP, 30% of trade, and 30% of foreign direct investment. I'm really looking forward because especially of what just happened in the world, the breakdown of, of, of globalizations, of global value chain, uh, this is uh, especially proven by uh, the, the, the milita military aggressions in the, uh, in the Crimea, making it even bigger and becoming make, making important. But if you ask me, whether this is already going or not, I think it's already kicked off because the ASEAN scheme with this my uh, dialogue partners, you know, we already have, you know, the ASEAN uh, Australian New Zealand uh, free trade agreement, ASEAN China free trade agreement, ASEAN Japan free trade agreement. So we have these things. You know, the market access basically is already there, but the trade facilitations and making it to be more uh, comprehensive uh, will be done probably second semester of 2022. 
we're ready, willing and able to come back to trade, to create prosperity in the region, peaceful and balanced and inclusive, right, Professor? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll come back to the inclusive as well. Tak, what do you think? Do you think that RCEP is already beginning to show the benefits that you'd hoped it would? Not yet. I think uh, it's been only five months, and uh, it's already to say good or not. And the uh, key thing is China. Um, the success of RCEP is dependent on the commitment of China. The reason behind is, uh, first of all, China is under zero COVID policy. China is the center of the uh, global supply chain, which is a huge bottleneck to the world. And uh, our SEP will be a huge um, supply chain over the world, and it should be led by China. So what about their commitment? And they will be a huge driving force of uh, our SEP. But we don't know about that, because to be honest, China is not fully trusted by the members yet. So they have to demonstrate their commitment to RCEP after zero COVID. So they have to gain the trust from the members over, let's say, for a couple of years. And then uh, gradually, members will get to trust uh, China because Chinese uh, reputation is not that good. But I think this is a great opportunity for China to show they are serious about free trade. And definitely, um, this is a great uh, uh, chance for China to be able to be a part of the global chain and to play a key role. And then that might be a pathway or a clue for China to be able to negotiate for for joining a CPTPP. Well, we don't have a Chinese delegate, a uh, Chinese person here to speak for China, but I will bounce that very quickly off before we go further. Back to the minister here and say, is that true? Do you feel that, uh, you know, the other members in RCEP don't trust China? I'm, I, Professor, you know, like, Sacha Sama, you have to be the optimistic one. I'm supposed to be the not optimistic one. <laughs> you know, yes. you know the, the, the study shows there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a graph given by, by the Dutch Institute of Think Tank. And it shows that uh, because of China, every country in the world is coming back with the global value chain, except China. But because they, they have their own ways on taking care, taking care of the economy. But for countries like Indonesia, this is a golden opportunity. You know, we look, we look at the, because of supply chain, we look, for example, the automotive industry in Europe. You know, from before COVID, after COVID, uh, the growth, market growth by 8%, but the supply growth industry only 3%. This number shows the same thing. You know, we are producing cars. We're beating Thailand right now. So before COVID, we sell about $8.8 .8 billion. You know, it would drop by 20%, but coming back, growth only 2.7%. You know what happened, Sajo, Sama? They're coming back and invest in Indonesia. So I'm very optimistic of this. This is what we call new equilibrium. How come we can you know, feel optimistic under the current COVID, uh, zero COVID policy of China? Because uh, every country has suffered now, and we don't know when the zero COVID uh, will be eased toward the uh, you know, normalcy. And uh, Minister, do you think, uh, uh, you know, after the uh, party assembly, are you sure that uh, you, China will get into I, I, the supply chain? I don't chain? know about the, I don't know about the assembly, uh, Mr. 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 CEO. You know what? They just announced the trade balance between Indonesia and China. A bit scared. You know why, Professor? Indonesia surplus 1.1 billion dollars with the Chinese. You know, I don't want this to be out in the open then because the Chinese will start looking mm, what we're doing wrong <laughs> and start doing anti-dumping and subsidy measures and everything like that. But Indonesia right now, a country that, you know, had a trade balance of minus 15 billions for the last, I don't know, 10, 20, 20, uh, 12 years, you know, last year, almost even, today, first quarter, 1.1 billion surplus. actually surplus. Yeah. Okay, I'm now going to jump in here because this is fantastic, but we need to let the That's others get a word thing. in edgeways. <laughs> Professor, what do you think? Do the numbers bear this out, the protectionism? So RCEP is, is a meaningful deal, and the ministers already hinted at this. Before RCEP happened or came into force, this region was putting in place non-tariff barriers like there was no tomorrow. In the five years before 
um, the pandemic, nearly 4,000 non-tariff bar barriers were put in place by the RCEP countries. About 40% of the trade between them is covered by those barriers. So there's plenty to try and cut away at or to rationalize, okay? This, though, will take time. Uh, and you know, trade agreements are a bit like your long-term fitness mm -hmm. trainer, right? They, they pay off over time. If you want to flip an answer, is, is, is RCEP working? Quite frankly, it's probably created more jobs in trade ministries than in the private sector by now, okay? But as the private sector's expectations adjust, and this is exactly the comment which I think we heard earlier, then they will then start adjusting, expanding, and this will generate benefits over time. If the World Bank's got the numbers right, this will pull up real wages in, in the RCEP region, and in particular in the sectors which hire a lot of women. So there is an inclusive, inclusive dimension to this well, as well. So I think the region's got to stick with it, and there will be payoffs. Eva, are you seeing this in global supply chains? Do you think that this, you know, some of the shifts that we're seeing, we definitely have seen shifts to Thailand, we've seen shifts to Vietnam, even Malaysia, and definitely Indonesia. Um, but what do you think? Well, right now it's hard to distinguish what's a result of the COVID situation and what's the result of RCEP and other policy measures. Um, but to underscore what Professor Evanett said, you know, coming out of such a big thing like RCEP, First, we see change, and only after a long time do we see improvement, because the, the change has to trickle down. And eventually, a lot of supply chains will have dramatic changes in their endpoint amongst the, the member states, and business will have to adapt. They'll have to get to know new consumers. These are different markets. So they have to change their planning, they have to change capacity management, but gradually what we will see are simplified supply chains and transport and logistics, that creates value. Well, coming back to talk, I would say, if we look at Centauri, after all, people would say that RCEP is going to be incredible Centauri, even if it's not for Centauri, even if it's not immediately now, but in the future. This is a tremendous market for you in China and South Korea. In, so, in, in Japan, you've pretty much maxed up what you can do. Right. You are already so big. Was, so I, it's I a great interior. I was part of the negotiation for RCEP, and uh, Japan will get uh, lots of benefits because we can export to China quite a lot, and uh, zero tariff item will be increasing over 10 to 20 years. So that should happen. From that perspective, I'm so optimistic. But uh, there, there is a huge headwind led by the United States. There are so many you know, trade pacts. And as a matter of fact, the IPF is not, not trade pact, which means uh, if <coughs> China shows it's opening the market, I think uh, they can alleviate the you know, strong headwind from uh, many countries led by US. I think uh, definitely China has to dem demonstrate its commitment within a couple of years after zero COVID. So I think uh, that's the key. That's my point, and I want to be optimistic because Japan will get a huge benefit, and the Santori will get, you know. So we are on the same boat, but uh, what about China? <laughs> okay, now let's move to the other big sort of elephant in the room for all people now, and that is inflation. The immediate idea, though, is you think, hey, you've got this fantastic trade deal. As Minister pointed out, 30% of global GDP is covered now by RCEP. Is RCEP, or for that matter, any trade deal, is it going to be able to help push down prices so that people won't find it so expensive to buy things? If, if I was going to be cruel, I would now switch over back to Tuck and say, you have recently raised the prices for soft drinks across the board. Well, that's pushing prices up, and that's for ordinary people who, who want to buy a, you know, a, an energy drink, uh, a lovely Boss coffee. Yeah, that's right. Um, we have to respond to the current uh, jeopardy of the global supply chain. Though Japanese people are not uh, resilient enough to accept a further price hike, but uh, I think uh, definitely even manufacturers have to pass on to customers to some extent, depending on situation of each country. But I think uh, this uh, uh, supply chain jeopardy will continue. And plus, uh, our yen is weaker and weaker, so, uh, but I'm not happy that uh, consumers are not accepting. 
Well, consumers are not happy that you've raised the prices. At all. At all. <laughs> so be fair on the other side. Professor, yes. So, I mean, if the IMF's got this right, the reason we're getting inflation in a lot of countries is too much demand chasing too few goods. So one way to fix that is to have more goods coming in. Abroad, sourcing from abroad is one option. And secondly, of course, as demand is diverted towards imports, uh, this uh, relieves the pressure on domestic markets. So trade could actually be part of that solution. There's a really interesting debate going on in the US now about exactly this, with interesting divisions within the, the Biden administration on this. Now, I'll be frank, Trade deals are not the cure for inflation, and trade reform is not going to solve inflation overall, but it can make a positive contribution pulling down the prices of things, some, some aspects. And as I'm sure our colleague will highlight, the more stable and fluid supply chains are, the more reliable they are, then, of course, that sourcing from abroad will expand. And so I think there is a trade dimension, there's a trade contribution here, uh, but uh, you know, governments have got to grasp it. Eva, talking about, that's one of the things that I know that you've looked at, and that is, you know, that fundamental question. Am I going to get, you know, the dress I ordered, the, you know, the new year piece that I want to have? Am I going to get it reliably, and am, am I going to get it delivered cheaper? Yes. Are we? Yes. Well, hopefully soon. Um, this is <laughs> a non-answer, but uh, it, it is incredibly complex right now because those in inflationary pressures of the too much demand chasing not enough supply. The, the core of that issue has to do with China and it has to do with the global reaction to transportation dislocation that we've experienced in the last years. Because if I am a business at any point in a long supply chain and I'm caught out, I don't receive my inputs on time, I can't deliver to my customers, that is extremely bad for my business. So what do I do? I start to hoard and I start to stockpile. And we've seen that consumers doing this throughout the pandemic. And that blows up the working capital at every link in a supply chain that lowers their margins. So everyone is increasing prices. It's a vicious circle. But if we get more reliability, and this comes back to the what about China, because once China is active and back to business as usual, RCEP will act a bit as an Asia for Asia, yes. giving shorter, more stable supply chains that cushion the region and member states from shocks in the rest of the world like what we're seeing in Europe. Minister, do you agree? Asia for Asia? Oh, that's, this, is, this is by default because, you know, I think, I, I think this is also to teach, you know, to tell everyone that we have to come back to trade. You know, Ms. Lin, I, I, I call for a special, special ASEAN economic minister's special meeting. So this is not in the agenda last week in Bali to make sure that every single one of this ASEAN minister in the same page with everyone, to make sure that you know we have to come back to trade, we have to come back to economy, and don't let this divergence be that politics, security, whatever. We have to come back and create a regional, peaceful, inclusive, and prosperous region. But minister, then we come to that question. Indonesia has banned the export of palm oil. That is a security issue, but for many, you might call that a protectionist issue as well. Oh, you know, I, I so, hate to say this, okay? <laughs> That's why I said it depends on who's saying it. You know, when the European, when the Americans, when the developed countries doing it, for example, do you know at one point, back in July, last July, they have, the European owns 3.7 more vaccine than the populations. 3.7 times more. And they call it security. When Indonesia is doing it, that's protectionism. So, come on, let's, let's, let's <laughs> go over that, you know, and let's do this because at the end of the day, we are serving the democracy that we are coming from. And the democracy in Indonesia is 270 million people. They're loud and they have what they call new things, they call social media. Mm -hmm. And this is an oh my God. <laughs> okay, well, let's take an overview on that. Professor, you actually yep. track <coughs> protectionism stroke security. Is the minister giving a fair uh, review of this? He was comparing vaccines with palm oil. <laughs> I mean, we've tracked both, actually. And, uh, and I, I mean, I don't pick sides on 
Europe versus Asia. I we track what I governments hope you accept do. that he's not picking oh, sides. Yes, no. <laughs> and uh, he's right to say that we have seen export curbs in in both areas. I think the vaccine export curbs and the curbs on uh, shipping uh, vaccine ingredients to the extent that they happen were very bad public policy. Um, and something we sh should have avoided. But I think the point to put back to the minister is, look, you know, we've seen how bad vaccine export curbs are. We're now seeing how bad food export curbs are. Don't we need a new global understanding on when these curbs should be used, how long they should be last, how long, and whether or not you know, they should be tracked systematically by the WTO Secretariat? Because none of that's happening at the moment. We, we, we did it on the 28th of May. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, on the 28th of April. We... Uh, we allow it on the 23rd, so it's done, finished, okay? So we are teaming it back. When you said that understanding, who should start first? The developed country or our developing countries? No, this has to be global, right? We are now right. a global world. We're, I mean, what happens in Indonesia matters in Europe. What happens in Europe matters in so Indonesia. Now, so we have to have everyone. Yeah, so time. Professor, now, yes. the issue is right now, I don't want to be the one start or not to start, but right now, Indonesia is a country in a run. We need to double the GDP before the end of the, of the decades, you know, because we are a middle class. And if we don't do this trajectory of 5.7% every year, we will be trapped in a middle income trap, okay? Mm -hmm. I have a set schedule and I need to jump up the value chain every year and I have a set, set up things. <coughs> COVID didn't help, but right now, you know, my, my biggest, my biggest uh, not, I wouldn't say enemy, but my, my biggest trading partner that does not comply with that called the European Union, okay? And because of that, you know, I have two right now dispute in the dispute settlement body. Before the end of uh, a semester, I'm going to have four. And we predicted at least we're going to have eight by the end of the year. If we don't have multilateral trading system, countries like Indonesia cannot be guaranteed that we can be served you know, with a good ruling of multilateral trading system. So right now, what they, what they say is, you know, when Indonesia doing it, it's protectionism. When they doing it, you know, but at the end of the day, this is national interest. We're feeding our people. So with that, you know, Indonesia would like to come back. You know, if everyone is behaving well, we are going to behave well too. Mm. Along with ASEAN countries, we are going to do that. But my agenda with my ASEAN colleagues is set. We have to go up the value chain. But can I say here, that, I mean, Indonesia is the G20 president this year. You, ha you are in the chair. You could put this on the agenda and get the big players to start talking about how they could first build trust amongst themselves and come up with a new understanding on the use of these tools. Are the developed countries like Japan, playing by different rules? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, what lacks uh, our set is the uh, kind of strict system to monitor what's happening. For example, um, we don't have such a system just, just like yours. And uh, I think uh, the uh, key success factor is of uh, our set is uh, uh, we should not create uh, big winners. We should not create big losers. That is a key point to maintain our ship going forward. So I think your case, maybe we should have a dialogue <coughs> among our ship members. That's a system. And if Japan exports too much to cause a problem to your country, maybe the system to talk, monitor. Maybe Japan is too good, I mean, too, too big, I mean, benefiting too much. We have to adjust. Otherwise, we can't keep our ship you know, going forward. So we need a strict I, system. I, I, and, uh, I, I and totally I'm talking disagree, about yes. enforcement. And somebody has to do it, but we have to work together, such as uh, you know, um, the uh, committee to talk about the what's wrong, what's good, to better off always this system. And I think uh, from first day of the uh, RCEP, I don't think nothing is you know, perfect. But over time, we have to streamline for the better. In the case of the security, we have to discuss. <coughs> Trade deals can never be enforcement, Ark. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone would think that a trade deal can actually function if you have to <coughs> bully your, your members into doing what they agreed to do. That's a set of mind, Ms. Lin. Okay? This is the problem with development. When somebody's developing, somebody, it's like a reserve. You know, this is like a bottle. 
the water would go on the on the on the development side. But is it a zero sum so, game? It doesn't no, have no, to it, be, it's not it can be a bigger game. part. When, for when there is a development here, there is a de development somewhere else. <laughs> okay? So that is why the developed countries would like to say everyone has to win a little bit. I can't. I can't. You are at $42,000 GDP. I need to double this to 10,000. And this is the matter of national security and the matter of survival. If I don't do this, my democracy fail. I can't do that. So I need to go up the step and I need to do this, Ms. Lin, I have to do two <coughs> things to be not trapped in middle income trap. I need to invest in infrastructure and second is technology transfer. So this is the, this is the, the recipe. So I need to source this technology from somewhere else. If you don't give it to me, if the Japanese didn't give it to me, I have, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm going somewhere else. And that's what we're doing. I think we are giving you lots of aids, you know, over time and that we are trying to work with you quite a lot over yes, years. Yes, 50 that years ago, yes. A trust 50 years ago, in yes. Two countries. No, 50 years ago, yes. But today, I don't need your aid. I told the European, they can take away the, 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 uh, the corporate economic partnership agreement that we're talking right now. It's okay, because they the division of roles is fine. <laughs> among you know, your country, among the you know, 13 countries, division of roles, that's the you know, destination yeah. of this you know, trade deal. I can see there's real passion in this, and I hope that this passion is also felt in our audience. Is it a zero-sum game? Can we actually have trade deals that are really a benefit to all? I know it's a cheesy thing to say, but are they really win-wins? where we don't have to be one <coughs> taking away from another to, you know, the richer, the poorer person can only get richer by taking something away from the richer person. Or do we actually believe that, unfortunately, there is a certain amount of that? So I'm going to throw this to our wonderful audience here and see if we've got any questions. <coughs> yes, we have two questions here. I will take the, uh, I, I'm so sorry. There will be a small bias here. Uh, in favour of the beautiful woman uh, with the lovely red <laughs> OB. Uh, I'm sure that next time when you are wearing your traditional costume, I, I will prefer you. Yeah. But yes, please. Just state your name quickly and your, and, uh, your question, please. Yes. Um, hello, thank you. My name is Atoka. I'm a global shaper from Japan. Um, as per the discussion, it seems like China seems to be the center of all these uh, key problems of the global supply chain um, and inflation. And I understand that in this interconnected world, um, it, it is to some extent um, un inevitable that um, <coughs> one big country would affect the entire world. But then what do you think that, um, well, how, how should various stakeholders um, play a role so that they would be in, not not reliable on China and solve its own pro problems without having to um, be kind of reliable on the reopening of China. Okay, we'll take that one question first and then we'll move on to uh, the wonderful gentleman here and we'll, we'll try and, and, and pack these two questions in nicely. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Taisuke Sasanuma. I'm running, running a private equity fund management <coughs> in, in Japan. And then I've been uh, expanding my business to China and Asia, so I have a very strong, you know, sense of uh, issues in, the, in this matter. Uh, recently, Japan, U.S., and uh, Australia and uh, India made agreement uh, quad, yes. and then this is explicitly targeted at how to compete with the China types of uh, issues. Uh, and, um, and the purpose, right? So I would like to ask questions, and uh, Inami-san especially, how would this uh, quad uh, agreement be influential on actually movement or development of uh, RCEP? Um, then how would uh, finally eventually um, Japan-China business wise relationship be influenced by this movement? Okay, I think that actually we can collapse the two questions into one, and that seems to be a general apprehension that China is so big, and therefore uh, only when it is fully online again can we all benefit as well, in a way. And, and that is, is, of course, a very, very tricky question. I can see again we've got you know, strong responses here. Minister, so is well, the only answer that only when China comes online again uh, in a big way that's going to, to kickstart RCEP, or is it because without them, you know, okay. it's, it's just no point? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revisit a little bit, yeah. The trade deal is an enhancement so we can create a prosperity that is fair and beneficial for everyone. So that's the philosophy, okay? 
My trajectory has to do with national planning of what we are going to do with Indonesian, Indonesian deals. And now, I, 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 I just don't get it, you know. Why everyone thinks that China is the problem? You know, if China is the problem, it's an opportunity for Indonesia. So I, you know, I said, it's good. You know, if we, why you're just investing in the countries in one basket? Yeah. You know, people say, don't put your eggs in one basket. So everyone can learn. They're not doing it. So we have an inflow of investment. You know, if you look at the rupiah right now, we are very strong. Why? Instead of dollars coming out, actually foreign money is coming in, you know, for investment. So, I, I, again, I look at it as an opportunity. And a country need to put themselves positions it well, okay? One. Second, talking about IPF. IPF is a different thing. IPF is a norms and standard with no market access. So, you know, they want to create a gang and they want to invite Indonesia to be an, in, a, in, a, in a play gang. Okay, let's play. Let's draw together. But at the end of the day, this is a norm standard, no market access. So people understand. But for the United States to come back to the region and balancing the, the region, it's very important. And Indonesia welcome that because we would like to create this as an inclusive region, peaceful and also prosper. So that is a line and this is a destination. So Tuck, we are back to this argument, you know, is the, is the Orangina cup half full or half empty? So, you know, the way you're focusing in, you keep hacking at China, you you keep focusing on the half empty, but really, it's an opportunity for Japan, and it's an opportunity actually to, even while China is tackling its zero COVID policy, it's still an opportunity for Japan and for Suntory. Well, we have to keep uh, decoupling effort to some extent because uh, we can't anticipate when China will open. So we will shift to some extent to, for example, Indonesia. That's a great opportunity. But uh, China is too strong, for example, to, to get supply of uh, vitamin C's almost 100% from China. And can we build a new factory in Indonesia within a couple of years? It's almost impossible. It must. So, no, I mean, because uh, economy must. scale, totally different. Because China can enjoy the domestic economy scale, which is really strong. So realistic, I'm, I live in business, minister. So that's my, part of my answer. Going back to Sunderson's question, Quad IPF, I think you're right. It's not a, a trade deal. It's a kind of a strategic geopolitical, you know, uh, 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 pact uh, led by United States. However, as for the semiconductor or just like security issues, I think uh, it means a lot for the membering countries. And this Quad, I think India is an issue. They are not uh, very much positive to join the trade issues at all. Professor, you do international trade, but you know also it's always very closely linked to security issues mm. of other kinds. How do you differentiate? How do you say that's a protectionist trade, that one is got to do with some kind of security issue? Well, the smart thing to do is just to avoid the rhetorical trap. Don't call it protectionism. Just uh, The right way to look at this is, does a measure discriminate against foreign firms compared to domestic firms? And that's the test we always use. And then if someone wants to give it the P-word label, that's up to them, OK? And I think we've been around long enough to know that uh, uh, words like security have been used to mask discrimination against foreign firms. And, and that's, that's the bit which is, uh, which is worrying. On the broader question of IPEF, I, mean, I, I too share the view, it is great that the Americans are back. Mm -hmm. Um, now, they're obviously figuring out under what terms they can do economic cooperation with other countries if they can't do a traditional trade deal. But, that, I mean, that's fine. Let them go through this process of discovery. They appear to want to do interesting things on the digital economy, which must be important for all the countries in the Asia-Pacific region. So let's engage with them on that and see where it goes. So I, th I see a, a much more constructive uh, trajectory going ahead. Eva, I know that you use blockchain technology as well for a lot of your staff. So do, do companies who consult with you ever say to you, you know what, I don't want to use blockchain because blockchain is basically disseminated. It's all over the place and it's not controlled by one grouping. I want something secure that is only by my X 
national thing that I feel is safe. Do they say that to you? Absolutely. And actually our distributed ledger is a private ledger for that reason exactly. Um, both, you know, there are national interests at play in that issue as well as commercial interests. Um, blockchain cybersecurity is nascent. Mm. It's very difficult to say, I have a fully secure public blockchain. I can't put hand on heart and say that. I don't, and anyone who does, I'm very skeptical. So, you know, there's an issue of trust amongst nations, an issue of trust amongst businesses, but I don't think it's a zero sum game. I think technology drives innovation that creates value. And standard setting, while it may seem, you know, kind of trivial and academic, but until standards are set around technology, and right now a lot of that needs to be around digital technology, you can't deploy at scale. Innovation can't spread. And so its rewards are isolated. Now that can be an opportunity for innovators and, and businesses and countries who see a gap in an opportunity and say, hey, China's out of business right now. I have an opportunity. I'm going to grab it. But then it's limited in scale. If there are the right international standards for interoperability in both digital data formats and the information that needs to cross borders, turbocharges trade. I think one of the dangerous things is that we are now saying that we only trade with friends. Well, can't you actually also say that I don't really mind whether you're a friend or a foe, I, I just want a reliable trading partner. And to take away this, this sense of always having to use these terms, which are, have become very emotive, and in fact are no longer commercial, and don't have you know, very clear targets like uh, the trade minister has here of really increasing GDP, creating jobs for people. Do we need to stop using these terms, friend or foe, and instead look at the numbers? See if it creates jobs, see if it actually makes life for ordinary people better. What do you think? Well, this is, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm too trade, you know. I, you know, friends or foe, who's cheaper, who's better? I buy from them, yeah. period. You know, and that's, that's, that's a fact of life. You know, that's why, that's why, I don't know, you know, there is some kind of phobia here, but at the end of the day, people, company, pick the cheapest, the best and at today time is the Chinese you know and it's a fact of life but you know uh, an aspirations for a country like mine if they can do it why can I and that's a destination also so professor do you think that that's the case do countries when they do trade actually take away that all the, all the rhetoric, the, the, the friend, foe, the feeling, touchy-feely bits, and only look at the numbers when they do the protectionism? I think countries, when they make policy decisions, look very much at their own national interests, for sure. Uh, I think the dynamic we're seeing of people talking about friends and foes is very dangerous. This is a recipe for fragmenting the world trading system. I know the national security hawks in various places are pushing this, but we, I, I think those of us who are interested in a system which is transparent, open, predictable, really need to stand up and say, wait a minute, how much prosperity are we going to sacrifice on the altar of some you know, illusionary promise of national security? Okay, sadly, we're going to have to do a last round of questions, so I'm going to go through very quickly. Abba, if we look at RCEP, would you say that it is better to have it than not to have it? Yes, I do. I think um, it'll take time for the fruit to ripen on the tree, but it's, we've already got the blossoms there. It's yeah. coming. All right. Mm -hmm. Professor? It's, it's, it's a step forward for exactly these reasons. Yep. Yep. Tuck? Definitely. It will be you know, better off for the member countries, and uh, we work together <laughs> to trust each other. <laughs> Minister, you get the last word. I got just one, you know, this is the money where my mouth is. Mm -hmm. So that is the key. Where's the dough? You know, I, I, Indonesia has a saying, if you're not acquainted, there's no love. Mm. Now we got acquainted, I'm seeking for your love. <laughs> Love is the <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and for, on that wonderful note, we need more love. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there has been much, much too much uh, isolation, uh, disappointment, um, companies going out of business, people going out of jobs. I hope very much 
that we can move forward to something that's more positive. And this lively engaged panel mm. and the wonderful uh, audience around me actually reassures me that we can go forward to perhaps a bumpy 2022, but definitely a 2022 where we can keep our heads a little bit higher. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And thank you for being at the greatest or the biggest trade deal in the world.